So how are we doing? Everybody having a good time? Amazing, Jenny Beth, thank you very much. Very inspiring. And just as Jenny Beth was inspiring, the man I'm going to introduce next has been an inspiration to many, many, many Americans. This gentleman is actually a New Zealander who came to America on a mission. And he has been bravely and courageously working on that mission for many years. He's a dear friend, and I know you're gonna love him. If you haven't already met him, you will soon. And it's my honor to introduce to you Trevor Loudon. Very much. Thanks, Diane. Can you understand the southern accent? Okay. okay. Did you did you know that after the last election, after 2016, that Hillary Clinton seriously considered suing the devil for breach of contract? <laughs> but the only problem was he had most of the lawyers. So. So look, um, I'm going to take a little time today. I want to, um, at the end, towards the end of my time, I want to bring my friend uh, Ed, Bishop E.W. Jackson to talk about a project we're doing. But uh, I just want to say a couple of things about the 2016 election. Does anybody believe there may have been a touch of the miraculous on that election? Amen. Okay. I think even an atheist would have to acknowledge that. <laughs> But, uh, but how I see it is this, that election did not save America, it gave America one more shot. And if you look at the Old Testament, there was a lot of times when the Israelites, Israelites got one more shot, they got a second chance. But how many third chances did they get? We're going to make use of this one. Second thing I'll say is, uh, the Germans have this wonderful word, um, schadenfreude. It means to, to take pleasure in the pain of others. It's not a noble thing, right? But you tell me this, on election night 2016, about two o'clock in the morning, when they panned the Democratic Party headquarters in New York, and you saw those little snowflakes bawling their eyes out and hugging each other, did you feel a little bit of schadenfreude? But how much do you want to feel in 2020, folks? Because you are imagine that pain then. Now, I talk about national security, and we, we, um, we've mentioned, you know, we talk about Ocasio-Cortez and that, because the biggest threat to our national security is internal. It's the enemies within. The domestic enemies are the biggest problem. And they go on about Ocasio-Cortez all the time. You know, she's a socialist. She's a com she, you know, she's a member of Democratic Socialists of America, which is actually more left-wing than the Communist Party, by the way. But you got to understand, this is only the tip of the iceberg. Jerry Nadler, for instance, who heads the Judiciary Committee, he joined Democratic Socialists of America in 1977. He's a Marxist. Yet he oversees the FBI and the Justice Department and wants to lead the impeachment of the President. There are at least 100 members of the House right now and 20 members of the US Senate, including Jean Shaheen, who would have no chance whatsoever of passing the most basic FBI background check. They would not be allowed to drive a school bus, people. And if you don't believe me, I've got my movies out there, I've got my books out there, the enemies within, there's at least 20% of your Congress and 20% of your US Senate that's basically working for the other team, right now. It ain't just a Casio. Now the biggest national security threat you face right now is not Russia or China, I don't minimize them, or ISIS or Al Qaeda, it is illegal immigration. Just do a little bit of math, people. MIT released a, stu a study recently saying there are 22 million illegals in the country right now. 
Now, some people say it's more like 40, 50 million. We'll go with 22. Now, what proportion of those people, if they are given citizenship and voting rights, do you think will vote Democrat? No. Well, let's go with 80 percent. Be very conservative, right? So there are 22 million of them. 80 percent Democrat. 15, 16 million new Democratic Party voters overnight. Now remember, Hillary Clinton promised she was going to legalise every single illegal immigrant in the country within 100 days of taking office. Right? We came that close to losing the country, people. Because do a little bit of math. Mitt Romney lost his election by 2.5 million votes. Donald Trump won by 200,000 votes thanks to the wisdom of your founding fathers and the Electoral College, but actually lost the popular vote by three million. What do you think's gonna to happen to America if they get 15 or 16 million Democratic voters straight after the next election? You'll lose Texas, you'll lose Florida, you'll lose Georgia and Arizona and North Carolina straight off the top. And you tell me how you ever elect another pre a Republican president from that point. We've got to understand these are Marxist Democrats. They are the people who supported the Viet Cong in the 60s and the Sandinistas in the 80s and they want their revolution before they die and illegal immigration is the way to get it. To get complete power over this country that can never be challenged. Now I want to talk about, has ever anybody seen the amount of vitriol and hatred directed towards a sitting president as this one? You see, the Democrats understand that this is either Trump or them. This is either America or socialism. Because if Trump is successful, and he closes the border so young black kids can get jobs in their own communities again to stop the massive flow of drugs across the border. 60,000 Americans a, a year dying of heroin overdoses, most of which comes across the southern border, people. And the massive influx of illegals who are all going to vote Democrat and alter your congressional districts. If he can do that, America's got a fighting chance. And if he keeps bringing down the regulations and bringing down the taxes, you're going to see an economic boom like you've never seen. Anybody notice the slight difference between the Trump economy and the Obama economy? <laughs> well, you imagine the checkbooks that are going to open up if President Trump wins again, right? We ain't seen nothing yet. And I know there's a huge debt problem out there, but if we can keep the taxes coming down and the regulations coming down and the economy booming, we can get on top of it. We can get on top of the entitlement program. But we've got to keep the economy pumping. That's the foundation. And we've got to keep the military strong, because if the military's strong, our creditors back off, our allies stay with us, and our enemies fear us. If we cut the military, the creditors come calling, the allies desert us, and the enemies come for their piece of the pie. Very critical. Now I want to talk now about what I consider is the Democrats' plan for 2020. This is their strategy, and you heard it here first. <laughs> now, who remembers the old Rainbow Coalition of the 1980s? Jesse Jackson, the great scamster, right? Well, he had, a, he had an idea. You get the, the black radicals, the white radicals, the Asian American radicals, the Native American radicals, all the different colors of the rainbow, and you get a progressive coalition together. Now, so he got four million votes, seven, fourth in the Democratic primary in 1988, and he got seven million votes, which surprised a lot of people. But in those days, minorities were 12% of the population. Now they are 38%. He was before his time. Now, the Rainbow Coalition was completely run by the League of Revolutionary Struggle, a pro-Chinese communist group. They held all the leading positions. Now, when Jackson moved on, the League of Revolutionary Struggle dissolved and most of them went into the Democratic Party. 
One of them was a young man called Stephen Phillips, a young black law student from Stanford University. He left uh, college, became a Democrat, and he married very well. Does anybody rem remember Golden West Savings and Loan? Big savings and loan based in California, fifth biggest in the country, I believe. Well, the owners of that, Herbert and Marion Sandler, sold it to Arcovia for 2.6 billion. And they put half of that money into the progressive movement. They fund Center for American Progress, ProPublica, etc. Now, their daughter, a Susan Sandler, married Steve Phillips. So you've got a young revolutionary with access to hundreds of millions of dollars. So what do you think he's going to do with it? One of his first projects in 2005, he was sent down to um, he was sent down to Georgia for a meeting with George Soros and Tom Steyer and others, where they set up the Democracy Alliance. That's two. That's now 150 members, multi-billionaires, who put tens, hundreds of millions of dollars every year into the, into the progressive movement, and Phillips tells him where to put it. The second project in 2008, he got $10 million together and reinvent, reinvented the Rainbow Coalition strategy in the southern states, and he did a massive voter registration drive in 18 states, and that's how his good buddy, Barack Obama, got ahead of Hillary Clinton. This guy is a kingmaker. Clock TV.